Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Let's begin with the Word of Prayer. Father, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for being sovereign in control of everything and nothing surprises you. That's such a comfort to us because uh, we know you have only the best in mind, which may seem, sometimes be str a struggle for us because that's what's best for us. And so we appreciate that you have everything in control and that you love us and that we ultimately will spend eternity with you and we're looking forward to that. Father, as we continue to uh, study the, the topic of racism, one race, one blood, we, we pray that, that we might be part of the solution and not part of the, of the problem to racism in, in our communities, in our church, churches, in our uh, society. Father, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for, for loving us. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last week we began, we were in, in Lesson 6, and I'm calling this Lesson 6 Part 2, because we, we watched uh, the beginning part of one of Ken Ham's videos on this topic because he drives home what this entire lesson talks about. And I wanted to finish that, uh, that video. You saw the first 20 minutes or so of it last week, and we're going to watch the, uh, the second, or the, the, the final two-thirds of it, however, however that works. Remember, our focus on this lesson is we must be careful to evaluate truth claims by asking the right questions. That's what we talked about last week, and that's what what Ken Ham is focusing on is getting the facts right. And you only get the facts right when you ask the right questions. So this is a long segment, so uh, we're not going to do anything else until we're done and we're ready to ask questions. So this is part two. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week. So when you look at your little, little dog, you can say, come here, little degenerate mutant, come here. Because so, that's what they really are, okay? Now, you... You, you think about it, if you've got one of them, you know that you've got to pay a lot of money to keep them alive. That's what keeps the vets in business. If you've got one of those mongrel dogs in, as a mixture of everything in the neighbourhood, you can run over them with a truck and they'll get up and wave <laughs> and off they go. So, now, and, and by the way, here's the problem. We tell kids, look at these animals God made, then they go to public school, which the majority of them do, and they're told... Do you realize God didn't make them because they have changed? And, and, and these species have come into existence over time and, and your dogs were bred in the last few hundred years, which means God didn't make them and evolution's true and then they get indoctrinated and brainwashed. See, that's why we've got to make sure we teach them correctly. So God didn't make the poodle directly. He made the original dog. You get the idea? We've got, we've got to understand this. We, we don't teach those to our kids in our churches and, and homes, and unfortunately, they get led astray. And you see, I'm always looking to teach things from a, from a biblical worldview perspective. I had a little elderly lady once come to me, and she said, well, is my poodle going to be in heaven with me? Well, you know, I, I try to be gracious and gentle and sensitive, but I, I just said, well, ma'am, there's no sin in heaven. Uh, so that solved that problem, okay? So now... Let's go on here. I want you to look at this. So, if this is a poodle, if you breed a poodle with a poodle, all you're going to get is what? A poodle. Okay. But if you, could you breed poodles and get back the original dogs? No, because you don't have the genetic diversity. But could you take the original dogs and again get poodles? The answer is what? Yes, you've got that potential. Now, to help us understand, I want you to understand the genetic diversity that God has already put in, in creatures. The number of atoms in the universe is said to be 10 to the 80th power. That's a lot of atoms. If you took one man and one woman from this audience, how many children could you potentially have without having two with the same combination of information? It's that number. That number is so big you can't even think about it. 
People, do you realize something? DNA that builds a dog or a cat or a human is filled with information and it has a language system that reads the information. Matter has never produced a language system by itself and can't. Matter has never been shown to produce one bit of information. There are zillions of bits of information in living systems. Evolution is ridiculous. It can't happen. God made kinds with incredible genetic diversity. And so two of each kind gets on the ark. Seven of some, seven pairs of some. Two dogs on the ark, they come off the ark, they increase in number, but they're not going to stay together. As they split up from each other and move away from each other, different combinations of genes will survive in different areas depending on the conditions. It's called natural selection. It's like artificial selection, except it's, it's because of the environment that the selection occurs, not because we choose which one breeds with which. You get the idea? Help us understand, two dogs get off Noah's ark, S for short hair, L for long hair, S and L give medium hair in dogs, and they have an offspring. Oh, look, it's, here's what they do in the, in the schools. It's got something new, short hair, that's evolution. It's got something new. Do you know what's new? The combination of information. It's actually got less information than the parents. And then you get this one, and then you get this one. Oh, it's got something new, long hair. It's like Darwin's finches. Oh, look, Darwin's finches, bigger beaks and smaller beaks. That's evolution. No, it's just different combinations of the genetic diversity that was already there to give those features. And actually, it's got less information than the parents, which is the opposite of evolution. For evolution, you want new information that never existed adding into the genes to produce something that never was there before. That's not what you see. And so over time, what happens? Those that go towards a cold climate, in a cold climate, those with short hair and medium hair get cold and they die. And now you're left with dogs with just uh, L genes, which means on their own, they're only going to produce long-haired dogs. You could get a different species of dog, right? Uh, over time, those that go towards a hot climate, those with long hair and medium hair, overheat, and they die. And now you're left with dogs with only has S genes. So what's new? Natural selection involves new combinations of already existing information, the genetic diversity that was already there, a loss of information, conserving the information that was there, but there's no brand new information. That's the opposite of evolution. So natural selection is really a downhill process, the opposite of evolution. And so over time, what happens? You end up having these animals that adapt in that sense. That's what they call adaptation. Natural selection resulting in different species. But it's not evolution. Think about this for a moment. There are 338 breeds of dogs after several hundred years. What can natural processes do in a few thousand years in the wild acting on genetic, created genetic diversity? See, we know much can happen in a short period of time because the genetic diversity already exists. This is the key. Evolutionists say the genetic diversity has to be evolved, has to come about by natural processes. What we're saying, no, that never happens. The genetic diversity is already there, which is why speciation happens quickly. See, if you look at a Great Dane and a Yorkshire Terrier, they look very, very different. Did you know that Darwin actually said in England, look at the breeds of dogs, look at the, look at the difference there. So given enough time in the environment by natural processes, you can get these different species a part of evolution. Do you realize the wolf and the coyote are considered to be different species? Look how similar they look. Look at the difference here. And these are the one species. If you can get this difference in dogs, and you, you can breed those differences in a few hundred years, then what Darwin was saying, because you can do that in a few hundred years, over hundreds of thousands of years, look what can happen in the wild. Which is nonsense. It means here, that difference is, 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 it doesn't even look that great. It can happen quickly. And the point is, you can get massive speciation because of the genetic diversity. Think, the kinds on the ark have this massive genetic diversity, which in the post-flood world, as they move away from each other, you can get these different species. You wouldn't expect to see as much speciation today, simply because that genetic diversity, in a lot of instances, has been diluted. And so, over time, to help us understand, here's a wall for jar of jelly beans representing genetic diversity. And over time, you can get less and less genetic diversity till you get to the stage there's just not a lot <laughs> left at all. 
And by the way, just to go on the record, I hate cats. So you can see that. So Noah needed, Noah needed far fewer animals on the ark than we think he needed. Far fewer. And as we said, probably a thousand kinds. And most animals are pretty small. There was tons of room on the ark, as you'll see when you visit the ark. Now, what I want you to do is to apply this to the human kind. Because the same sort of genetic principles involved. How, how would you get distinct people groups within the one human race? Well, you'd have to have something that would split up the human population into groups and isolate them from each other. Can anyone think, is there anything in biblical history that explains how that could happen? It's very simple. The Tower of Babel, God gave different languages, you end up with different people groups. And as you go through the Creation Museum and you go through the Ark on the third deck, you'll see that we deal with that in detail. And one of the reasons I, 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 I deal with that, um, the, the book One Blood, One Race we produce, and I speak on this topic, because when I was a teacher in Australia, my very first teaching year in 1975, when I was talking to the students about the fact in the public school that we're all descendants of Adam and Eve and we're all one race and we're all equal and we're all one family, afterwards the Australian Aboriginal kids in the class came up and said, Sir, can you tell us more? And then I realised, of course, Darwin said they were closer to the ape-like creatures than others. And so they were considered the missing links. And here I was telling them, no, you're part of our family. You're related to all of us. And I saw the impact it had on them. And the Lord has given me a burden ever since then to deal with this issue. And I get, I get so frustrated at the racism and prejudice I see even in our churches in America because they don't have a biblical worldview based on Genesis. Because if you did, the church would be leading the way in dealing with racism. Because we know there's only one race. You know, when Darwin wrote his book on the origin of species by means of natural selection, the rest of the title was Preservation of Favoured Races and the Struggle for Life. Now, that book was about animals, but at the end, in the last chapter, he said, in the distant future, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. Twelve years later, he wrote the book, The Descent of Man, and The Descent of Man inherently is a racist book. It really is. Darwinian evolution inherently is a racist philosophy, but it's taught in our public schools as fact. Now, it's interesting. If you look at some, some things that have happened, like recently, uh, the American Library Association had a, an, uh, an award named after uh, Laura Engels Wilder because of her little house on, on the Prairie series. And they decided, when you look back and read that series, oh, there was racism in there. And uh, so they decided that no longer will they allow that award to be named after her. And we've heard of books being banned and all sorts of things because of so-called racism. Actually, if you read The Little House on the Prairie, Laura Engels, um, she was actually fighting against racism against the Indians, if you read it in the right context. And it's, it's, it's in the context of history that those books are written. Uh, here's the interesting thing. The, the, the girl portrayed in the books was definitely not racist. If you're going to say you've got to ban uh, a, a library award because of those books, they should be banning Darwinian evolution from the school system. But of course, that's not what they want to do, so they ignore that. You, you know, it's interesting. How many of you here have read The Origin of Species by Darwin? Have actually read it? I see a couple of hands, maybe three. How many have read The Descent of Man? I'm not sure I see any hands. Do you, you know, most school teachers, majority, have never read The Descent of Man. Do you know, in fact, most evolutionists don't even know what Darwin taught? You read his books and you'll see what he taught. That's why the late uh, Harvard paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould said this, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. In Darwin's book, The Descent of Man, he says, this is just one example, at some future period, the civilized races will exterminate the savage races, the break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider than the Caucasians and some ape as low as a baboon instead of now is between the Negro, Australian Aborigines and the gorilla. Do you realize what he's saying? The Australian Aborigines and, and people from Africa are closer to the apes than the Caucasians. How's that for racism? That's what Darwinian evolution is all about. 
That's why in 1924 there was a New York Tribune newspaper published that said the missing links were found in Australia, the Australian Aborigines. There were scientists from England and Germany who sent people to Australia to hunt down the Aborigines, to herd them over cliffs or into swamps and, and with instructions on how to skin them and boil up their skulls for specimens in the name of evolution. Do you know in 1925, the year of the Scopes trial, John Scopes supposedly taught from a particular biology textbook about uh, the evolution of man and so on, and actually that was a setup by the ACLU, but did you know uh, the, the textbook that was sort of the center of this trial in a way, and a major biology textbook used in public schools in America in the 1900s and was used in 1925, said this, the races of man and based on Darwinian evolution, at the present time there exist upon the earth five races, the highest type of all represented by the Caucasians, uh, represented by the civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. Generations of kids in the public schools, based on evolution, were taught the Caucasians are the highest race. And we wonder why we have so much racism and prejudice in our culture. Now, of course, there's all sorts of other factors, I understand that, but I'm saying we've got to recognize that Darwinian evolution itself is inherently a racist philosophy. And in fact, I like to encourage the church, I want to suggest to us that we get rid of the term races. And I'll tell you why. When you go back to the Thomas A. Thomas Jefferson and so on, when you talked about races, you talked about an English race or an Irish race, the word race has changed meaning. The word race used to mean cultural group or ethnic group. But because of the influence of evolution, a lot of people today have been indoctrinated to believe there's lower races, higher races, primitive races, uh, and, and savage races, and, and, and all the rest of it. So people, I'm going to challenge us as a church, we need to get rid of the term races. I want to suggest to us we use the term people groups instead. Because here's the other thing, I will say to you that the, the people like Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton are fueling racism by the very terminology they use, which actually is incorrect. Because they talk about the races and the black people and the white people, there are no races and there really are no truly black or white people. And I'll explain that to you as we go on here. Did you know the secular world knows there's no races? Journal of Counseling Development, 1998, evidence continues to collect the term race is meaningless, used to point out differences in people that are not definitive. When I went to school, I was taught there were these main racial groups, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid, Australoid. I never knew to ask my professors, how did you get those groups? On what basis? Because we've now found the basis on which they determined those groups was false. When the Human Genome Project headed by an atheist actually, Dr. Venter, mapped the human genome around the world. They collected genes from all around the world, from humans. And you know what they announced to the world in the year 2000? There's only one race, the human race. Wow. Who would have thought of that? You know when they announced that? Do you know what I didn't hear the church doing? Told you! Because if we really believe God's word, if we really believe the book of Genesis, the trouble is because of the compromise with evolution of millions of years and because many even conservative pastors say we're not scientists, we don't know how to deal with Genesis, they've hived Genesis off and said let's tell you about Jesus, but the geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology and Genesis is foundational to our doctrines, foundational to our worldview. And because we so ignored the book of Genesis, we handed generations of kids over to the public school to be indoctrinated in evolutionary ideas, then the church doesn't lead the way in regard to racism, it actually helps fuel it. See, Nature Genetics, an evolutionist scientific journal, humans vary only slightly at the DNA level and only a small proportion of this variation separates continental populations or people groups. And this one from the American biology teacher, 2000, uh, and, well, there's a date there somewhere, but 2011. Here is the biological problem with race. The genetic variation within each of the various ethnic groups of Homo sapiens is greater than that between the various ethnic groups. You know what they're now saying? When you take those different groups that were once classed as races, the genetic diversity within a group is greater than that between the groups. Which means the concept of race is meaningless from a scientific perspective. And in fact, nature genetics, again, the genes that explain phenotypic differences like hair color, skin shade, and so on, between populations only represent a tiny part of our genome, confirming once again the concept of race from a genetic standpoint has been abolished. 
and the American biology teacher 2011, all humans are one race, homo sapiens, there is absolutely no genetic or evolutionary justification for racial categories of humans. New York Times, in regard to the Human Genome Project 2000, the criteria that people use for race are based entirely on external features we are programmed to recognize. And in America, people are programmed to look on the outside, particularly in regard to what they call skin color, black, white. Is that not correct? And then we get people getting up, and our politicians and others, getting up and talking about the black race and the white race, and they fuel racism. And, and I, they, you know what? I think they know this material. I mean, it's out there. It's been there for years. But if they, if they taught this, if the media taught this, then they wouldn't have any controversy out there. And I believe a lot of these people want the division. As Christians, we want everyone united in regard to the word of God and saved for eternity, which is what it's all about. You know, let me give you an example here. People say, well, then how do you get black people and white people? Ac actually, there are no truly black people or white people. People say, I'm a white person. I don't want to be a white person, to be honest. Not right now. I've got too much to do. See, look, I can prove to you I'm not a white person. That's white. If I look like that, you'd be calling 911. <laughs> do you realize if I got somebody up here that you said is a black person, you put a black sheet of paper beside them, true black, you realize they're not black. Everybody is brown. We, there's one ba basic pigment, it's called melanin, two forms of it. It's more complex than this, but this gives you the basic principle idea. If big A and big B mean a lot of melanin, little A and little B mean a little bit of melanin, if you had all big A's and big B's, you'd have dark skin. Little A's and little B's, light skin. If you had a mixture, middle brown, the world's population, the majority, if you look at the bell curve in regard to skin shade, the majority are middle brown. And to help us understand, this is um, a section through our skin, and the top layer here called the epidermis. At the bottom of the epidermis, there are cells called melanocytes that have little organelles in them, melanosomes, that produce packages of melanin. And so, depending on what genes you have, if you have genes that say you produce a lot of melanin, you'll produce a lot and you'll be dark, dark skin, or genes that produce not so much melanin. When you tan, you will produce melanin, it will stimulate uh, your skin to produce melanin to a maximum that your genes tell you. It's very easy to understand. Those differences in skin shade, not skin color, skin shade, are just minor differences. And they are. Genetically, they're very minor. You see, what shade was Adam and Eve's skin? Not what color. Everyone's the same color. And I'm going to challenge us, and we need to change our terminology. You, you don't talk about what color someone is, it's what shade they are. We shouldn't be talking about races because of Darwin's ideas. Let's talk about people groups. There are people that say, there's a group of colored people. I've heard Al Sharpton get up on, on TV and say, now people of color, and I say, oh, that's everyone. Do you realize everyone in this room is a colored person? If you're not, you've got a problem, okay? Everyone's related to everyone else. Do you realize what a difference it makes when you look at somebody that you don't like and say, they're my relative? And then ask yourself, are they going to heaven? Do you want your family in heaven? See, it makes a big difference the way you look at people when you realize we're all one race, we're all one family. And, you know, there, there's a lot of applications that, that we can make. For instance, I was at a church and uh, a man came up on stage after I spoke and he said, you mean to tell me there really are no truly black people? I said, that's right. Huh. Because he had very dark shade skin. And he said to me, well, I voted for President Obama because he was black, and now you're telling me that was a stupid reason to vote for somebody. I said, yeah, that's a stupid reason to vote for somebody. <laughs> but, because, you know, and you know, as Christians, I use that as an example for the audience, and I said, do you realize, as Christians, you don't vote for somebody because they're black or white, which is not correct anyway, and you don't, we shouldn't vote for somebody because they're Democrat or Republican or Independent. Do you know, as Christians, what we should be doing, what we should train our kids to understand? Look, there's no one perfect in the world, and, and, and politicians, you know that. Uh, and what we should be doing is though saying, as Christians, I want to be salt and light, but what I need to do is judge whatever anyone's saying, the, 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 what they say, their behavior, etc., against the absolute authority of the Word of God, then that should drive how I vote. That's being a Christian. 
And you know, uh, another church I was at, uh, was, I remember it distinctly. A man and his wife were sitting with the pastor over on my left. And the man had very dark skin, the pastor had very light skin. People would call that an interracial marriage. There's no such thing as interracial marriage. There's only one race. Biologically, there's no such thing. So when we say that's an interracial couple, what a load of nonsense. There are no interracial couples in the sense of biology. There are spiritually, but not biologically, right? There's a big difference. And I remember the man turned to a pastor and he says, this is great, I'm just pleased to know I'm not married to a white woman. <laughs> so there you are. And, and you know, there's other applications. You know when you go to the doctor and, and, and they give you these long forms and you've got to fill out all these stupid things, and one of them is, what race are you? I encourage everyone, write down Adams. <laughs> when it says other, Adams. And when the person at the desk says, Excuse me, what's this Adam's race? Adam? Didn't you know Adam was the first man? Did you know we all come from Adam? God created Adam and Eve, and we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, and Adam sinned. And because of sin, that's why death came into the world. That's why we're going to die. You're going to die. You know you're going to die, right? And it's because of sin. And that's why God sent his son. You know the babe in the manger? Die on a cross, be raised from the dead, offers a free gift of salvation. You need to, you need to repent. See the gospel in 30 seconds right there. <laughs> Hey, but can you imagine if Christians started doing this sort of thing? You start to be a witness in the community. You say, I'm, I'm going to help lead the way in regard to these issues. And then those songs we learn. Oh, who remembers this one? Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious. And he's, you remember that one? Actually teaches kids wrong ideas. Imagine if we taught generations of kids this. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, shades of brown from dark to light, all are precious in his sight. Now that gives you the right idea. And so, when we think about Adam and Eve, if Adam and Eve had all little A's and little B's, the whole world will be like that. If Adam and Eve had all big A's and big B's, the whole world will be like that. But that lacks the genetic variation we see. And so it makes much more sense that Adam and Eve are in the middle with a mixture, the maximum genetic diversity that God created, just like he did in each of the kinds. And then you get a whole range of variations from that. And that's why, for instance, around the world, there's lots of examples of twins like these. These are from Australia and these primarily from England. Uh, there's lots of examples of twins like this. It's very easy to understand because it depends on the genetic diversity in, in the parents and what combinations they got. And so, over time, because of the Tower of Babel, you could get some groups that only had big A's and big B's. On their own, that's all they're going to produce, dark-skinned people. Over time, you might end up some groups that only have little A's and little B's, only produce light-skinned people. For them, remember, poodles with poodles only give poodles, right? For, for those people to produce kids that had um, a range of skin shade, they're going to have to mix with somebody who's got some of those other genes from the original genetic diversity that God put there. Very easy to understand. And then eye shape, sort of similar. Um, one of the major factors in eye shape is the amount of fat in your eyelids. It's just a minor genetic variation. That's all it is. And as ABC News said, even in 1998, what the facts show is there are differences among us, but they stem from culture, not race. And people, the answer to racism is simple. It's the true history of the world. That's the answer to racism. To see people saved, one to the Lord, and to build their thinking on the Bible and to recognize we're all one race, we're all equal before God, we're all sinners, we all need the same solution, Jesus Christ. And you know, when anyone says to me, whether it's in Australia about the Aborigines or anyone else, and they say, yeah, but we were so wronged in our history, and look what happened in history, and look what these people did in history, do you know what I believe we should say? Do you know what? None of us deserve anything. We didn't deserve what God did for us. We committed high treason against the God of creation. We sinned against God. We, we don't even deserve to exist. Do you realize what he did for us? He stepped into history to pay the penalty for our sin. The, oh, woe is us the, the, that we're sinners, but God wants to save us from what we did. That's the answer. Instead of looking at wrongs of the past and all the rest of it, the answer is we need to see, understand who we are before a holy God. That's the answer. 
You know, I've already mentioned that there's no such thing as interracial marriage because there's only one biological race. But there are two spiritual races. Being not unequally yoked with unbelievers, what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, which is a principle that also applies to marriage. You see, which impending marriage here does God's word clearly counsel against? Does he counsel against this one, or this one, or this one? Which one? Clearly see. Biological fact, all humans belong to one race. Spiritual fact, all humans are divided into two races. What is the difference between the two spiritual races? The direction in which they are racing. There's the broad way, which is the world we live in. There's a narrow way within the broad way that goes in the opposite direction. And you know, I've met people who are more concerned their son or daughter not marry someone they think is from a different biological race instead of whether they are of the same spiritual race which is what the doctrine of marriage is all about. And so, the interracial marriage that God's word speaks against is the marriage between the two spiritual races when a Christian knowingly marries a non-Christian. That's the interracial marriage that God's word speaks against. Now I know sometimes there's people who've married and one becomes a Christian and so on, and God has principles to help uh, that, that person and, and, and to win uh, their their loved one to the Lord and their mate to the Lord and all the rest of it, but that's a whole other issue. But you know, I've actually had people tell me, but wait a minute, God said the races weren't to mix. Really? Where did he say that? Well, he said the Israelites weren't to marry the Canaanites. Oh, he did actually. Yeah, he did say that. That's true. Let's have a look at that. Let's look at Rahab, who was a Canaanite, lived in Jericho, and... Of course, the Israelites were told not to marry the Canaanites, but it seems the same Rahab is in the lineage leading to Jesus. How could that be? Because she stopped being a Canaanite spiritually and became an Israelite spiritually, believing in the true God, then she's free to marry an Israelite. It was not biological races, it was spiritual races as to why they were told not to marry the Canaanites, because they were pagans. So you see, people, I want to challenge us that we, we look on the outside and we see differences in hair color, eye shape, ear shape, earlobe shape, nose shape, skin shade. Do you realize all those differences are minor genetic differences? They really are. Minor part, a tiny part of our genetic diversity. And the trouble is we, we tend to look on the outside. God gives us a principle that it's the inside that matters. The inside. For instance, when Samuel came to anoint the king, you know, he, had, he didn't know it was going to be David. You can imagine him seeing one of David's brothers, oh, in modern vernacular, tall, handsome, football star at the school. Obviously, he's going to be the king. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Next time somebody comes into your church, maybe, um, has a different skin shade to you, instead of looking on the outside, we, we need, to, need to deprogram ourselves to understand that's just a minor genetic difference. We need to look on the inside. Does that person need my, my love? Do they need, do they need the gospel? What do they need? When you see a drug deal on the streets, which there are places you can, what a difference when you say, they're my relatives and they're probably not going to, 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 to live with the Lord forever. How can I reach them with the gospel? Maybe there's an inner city mission that I can, that I can help. Maybe I can get our church to make sure we're, we're helping reach these people with the gospel. Hey, we have people that call us and say, we have a, we have a mission to inner, inner city kids that, that, that a lot of them are destitute and so on and we're trying to reach them with the gospel we open our arms to let them come into the museum and the ark and for, for, to witness to them and then imagine a Christian girl and she sees this guy at school maybe oh he's tall, handsome, the football star wow I wish he'd asked me to go out with him hey young lady you're a Christian does he love the Lord with all his heart and all his soul and all his mind because it is not the outside that matters, it is the inside. Well, imagine a guy, a Christian guy, and he looks at this girl, oh, she's so pretty, intelligent, just the right amount of melanin I like. <laughs> wow, I'd like to go out with her. Hey, you know what, young man? 
You're a Christian. Does she love the Lord with all her heart and all her soul and all her mind? It is not the outside that matters. And I've got a message for all the guys in this room that you need to remember. The outside changes with time. <laughs> Look at the mother. You'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Now I'm in trouble, aren't I? <laughs> hey, so when my wife was with me sometimes, I'm talking on this topic, she'll be down the front and I'll say, take my wife. I remember when she was 17 and gorgeous and beautiful and now 48 years later, she's more beautiful than ever. I know the right thing to say. Actually, what is it, uh, December this year? 46 years married, December this year. So, and we actually have five children. I wasn't going to say this, but you know, I may as well. We have five children, and four of them are married. One is single. Great cook. And we have 16 grandchildren. And so we love to see our children passing on that spiritual legacy to the next generation, which is what it's all about. But you know what? The thing that we need to remember, and you know, my wife and I can say we love each other more than we ever have. Because if you fall in love with the outside, you can fall out of love, but you choose to love the person. And make that commitment before the Lord. That's what it's all about. Hey, you know what's fascinating? What's fascinating is that we can talk about... You think about it today. Do you realize what we did today? We talked about... Cain's wife, we talked about poodles, <laughs> mentioned cats, we, we talked about Noah's Ark, how many animals on the Ark, we talked about the flood, we talked about other dogs and genetics and genetic diversity, and we talked about the Tower of Babel, and we talked about skin shade and racism and prejudice and marriage and dating all in the one talk. How could you do that? Easy. When you take the history in geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology and Genesis 1 to 11 as foundational to your thinking, then you realize it enables you to understand this world, to know what you believe, why you believe what you do and what a difference it makes. Now before we dismiss, which we'll do in a moment, just give me um, about one minute, two minutes real quickly. One of the most important parts of our ministry are the resources we have. I encourage you to go to our website, answersandgenesis.org, uh, and join the 30 million people a year that get on our websites. We have a kids' website as well. We have a special You Choose program, and so you can put together the different combinations of books and DVDs at uh, different uh, prices. My book, The Lie, other than the Bible, which is the textbook of our ministry, this is the textbook of our ministry. It's what I spoke on yesterday, all of our doctrines in Genesis. It really challenges Christians to believe God's word in Genesis and that to be the foundation for your worldview and why Christians can't compromise God's word beginning in Genesis. And this one, I'm talking on this tomorrow, actually, Gospel Reset. How do you take the gospel to a culture that's changed foundation? How do you do that? Because I'm going to say to you that the, that the church, by and large, much of the church is using the wrong method of trying to reach the generations today with the gospel. The gospel hasn't changed, but their method is incorrect because they're using a method that reached the older generations, but the younger generations are very different in the way they think. You can no longer go to the younger generations and say, the Bible says, you sinner, and God says, because immediately they interpret the word God differently, they don't know what sin is, and they've already been indoctrinated to believe this book is not true. So I'm going to talk to you about, this is a brand new book, came out a month ago, how to take the gospel to our secularized culture. These five books are the biggest selling creation apologetics books in the world. 160 of the most asked questions. The problem we have is this. Most secularists have no idea why they believe what they do. They just regurgitate what they're taught at school. But most people brought up in the church don't know how to answer the what they say. commercial. While I support their ministry, we have other things to talk about. And if you haven't been to the Ark and the uh, uh, Creation Museum, it is well worth going. Right, Nance, Brian? Yes. Where is that? Uh, Kentucky. Just south of Cincinnati. Just off of I-75, south of Cincinnati. Yep. I think Florence, Kentucky? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, and... Uh, 
we had the privilege last summer of sitting into one of his lectures in that exact spot. Um, and then we, we saw someone else at the ark. And uh, it's well worth doing. It's a, it's, it's a couple of days to do it all, but it's well worth doing. Any questions or comments on, on that topic? We'll move on next week. Lord, well, No, not next week. Um, because Tony and Kathy will be with us next week, uh, week after, Lord willing. I have a question. The only thing that wasn't uh, specifically, I, I think you did address it, the features, physical features, do vary considerably. Mm -hmm. uh, kinky hair. Right. And then the lip size, possibly, yeah. and yeah. all the fingers. So is that all included in this? Yeah, it's all, it's all part of the genetic code. Uh, you know, he was talking a little bit about the eye shape. About, about how much fat there is, and 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 it's all it's all variations of of the same genetic code. Just just like you had the the short hair and the long hair and the dogs in that example, the same thing is true for all the variations. The, the amount of information contained in our DNA is is astronomical, and it's just small variations in that. And the reason you see you see folks from Africa, from, from sub-Saharan Africa, that have, a, a, they all have the basic same features. And then you see the people from, from Scandinavia, and they all have the same basic features, which are completely different, is because of, of the migration after, after uh, the Tower of Babel, or at the Tower of Babel. And that's what the next lesson will be about, is more about Babel. You, you have a concentration of those genetic details just like in the illustration of the long hair and the short haired dog when 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 dogs migrated around the world the dogs that were in the in the real hot area long hair didn't fare so well so after a period of time adaptation means now the 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 ones with the long haired dominant genes are not there so all you have is short hair and that's the, that's the reason we have the geographic dis distribution of the people groups. Yeah. I just realized how, how indoctrinated we were oh, yeah. in the schools. Wow. And, and the prime example is our little one here. She will go up and take anybody and she doesn't look at because she looks at the university. Yeah. And she could take that innocence and keep it. Uh -huh. How beautiful that would be. Yeah. Oh, we are so yeah, and, and not I don't want to get political on this, but there is a whole there's a whole part of our society that wants to foster that because that contains con, maintains control. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is not what we're what we're looking at is nothing new. What we're experiencing in our society is not new. It it is the playbook of Satan and has been around for a long, long time. I, I'm fascinated at the way. Ken Ham talked about the, the issue of, of the Israelites and their intermarriage and why that is not a, a, a physical racial thing. That, that, was, a, that was an excellent that was point. point. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's amazing how we, we think everything we learn, even no matter what generation, it's right. Then you, okay, that's completely 180 what you're actually expressing. Yeah, and that's what indoctrination does. Yeah. And, and and that's why when I wrote my dissertation why I wanted to focus on that because that's exactly what we do even in the church. The title of my my dissertation is the theological implications of uh, an improper ex, uh, exegesis and understanding of Genesis 1 to 11. So when you look at Genesis 1 to 11, and he talked about it quite a bit, when you look at Genesis 1 to 11, that sets the ground rules for everything else in Scripture. So when you get that wrong, like everything else is wrong. You know, CRT. Well, CRT is ridiculous. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it doesn't take a lot to, to go against uh, you know, the teaching of it when you have a, a doctrine such right. as ours. Right, right. Scripture has to be paramount. It has to be the final authority and can't ever bend to what the, the will of the people is today. Wouldn't Brock take this to the advantage? I'm telling you, this other son of mine, it would be an eye opener. They would, 
be praying for him. He'll yeah. show up. But it'll be an eye opener as long as the Holy Spirit is already working, so that he would accept that this there is some validity to this. Because a lot, right? And you can't. A lot of the world would reject this as not being. Uh, we talked last week uh, a little about. Uh, um, Bill Nye, the science guy, he completely rejects all of this. Yeah. He doesn't have the credentials to do that, but he completely rejects all of this. I think Brock would look into it Okay. Because he is that investigator. Well, then take a road trip with him to, uh, yeah. to Florence, Kentucky. Take him to the ark. Go through the ark and go through the uh, we have that creation museum. We're taking Harper there this, this summer for a uh, conference. It's well worth it. We don't marry unbelievers. There's right. a reason for that. Uneven, un unevenly yoked. And that, that whole idea, I've stuck to, and I, and I still agree. But I know it better now because I have studied all this. Because you know? the people that don't, they marry an unbeliever and they end up in mm -hmm. problems. Uh, and we will specifically warn not to do that. So. I've refused to do weddings when, the, when they weren't both believers. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah, I just, I won't participate. Yeah. Okay. Father, thank you for men like Ken Ham and, and all of the, the experts that he surrounds himself with that, that have a great ministry to, to reinforce what you've said in your word and to make it so that we can more readily understand it and teach it. Thank you for the, the work that they do to, uh, to insist on your word being supreme. Remind us of that every day. Remind us every day that you're sovereign. You're in control. None of what's going on around us uh, surprises you. And you are well aware of, of how we need to respond to it. So teach us, lead us, and, and give us the strength and the courage to, uh, to fight the battles that you want us to fight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.